Let me say hello guys, welcome back. It has been a week, you're a bit high there. Let me just fix your angle. Okay, it has been probably a week since I filmed anything. Let me change my glasses as well. To my cheap ones. This one amazing guys is, is cheap glasses with no reflective film and stuff on them. Nothing that stops me seeing polarizing glare on glass and stuff. You can see the difference between the lenses. These ones even look better and these are the cheapest ones probably in the store. Maybe like 20 30 dollars with the prescription lenses. These ones were probably 200 dollars and yeah guys just look at this look. You see the bend in them? Not very good. Broken already so I have to get new glasses. Anyway guys how have you all been? How have you all been? It's another fantastic Saturday morning for you guys. So for me it is Monday morning. Hmm. A better way to start the day. And yeah, so I come in the shrimp room, check my tanks. Let's guys, let's just go over something and let's be very honest here. I've been putting off doing a tank build for a while because yeah, my back's just not up for it. Someone complained the other day that I talk about my back too much, but it's part of my life. It is part of my life and it stops me doing a lot of things, right? So today is going to be more of a talky video than us physically getting hands on doing stuff. But you're going to learn stuff because I've learned stuff in the past few days and yeah, we'll go over that as well. Because you can probably hear the difference in my shrimp room, how noisy it is in here compared to what it was, right? And I think, guys, I wasn't using my air system to its optimal level. Specifically, my filtration wasn't being used to the best it could be. And yeah, I'll have to actually, I probably will have to delete a video, I think, about this because I made a video called How to Set Up a Sponge Filter Best for a Shrimp Tank. And yeah, I don't think it is the best way. Right? So if I showed you a different way in this video and then I have another video saying something different, I'm kind of like contradicting myself. So I don't want to do that. I'll probably delete the other one, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the other things is as well is the, the shrimp room is doing great. Uh, we talked about the why I keep on putting off doing this build. As I said, yeah, my back is kind of I don't know what it is. It's just very sore a lot of the time, and I think I think it's starting to affect my legs a little bit because I am feel, feeling like I'm getting weaker in my legs. If you guys know what I mean. And yeah, I, I don't want to make it out that there's something majorly wrong with my back because I'm, I'm hoping all I need to do is like go back to my physiotherapist and maybe have me on a training program that I do every week or something. And it'll strengthen up my legs. Anywho, uh, let's get on with the shrimp tank stuff. Oh, by the way guys, I've been doing the testing that we did over there with our pH in our tub, reverse osmosis tub. Do you guys want to see that? We'll look at that first because that is quite a, an interesting one because I wasn't expecting the results I was seeing and it shows that something different happens in the tanks compared to the actual tub. Mm. And one other thing guys I wanted to talk about was, yeah, you guys are loving this format. I can see it. What is that? It's like a fish eye on the end. Yeah, I have a different lens on here that tries to cut out all the background glare like this. Let's see. If it works, see the glare in the background there? Let's see if this lens actually is able to move it. So it's a rotating lens. Uh, it does a little bit, doesn't it? You see it, let's put it so there's no... Uh, it, the difference is quite a lot actually, isn't it? It reduces the glare quite a bit. So that is what you're seeing. I wonder if I can actually zoom in a tad. The, nope, not so far, dumbass. Ah, maybe, maybe I should just have it fully out the way it is normally and then I can reframe this in editing. Because I'm a smart man. Yeah, thank you guys for um, liking this format that I'm doing. Right, the videos are much, much longer, and I can see by my analytics that you guys are enjoying them. Enjoying them in general, I can see that the views are down on this type of video, but the watch time in general is up a lot. I'm talking like three, four, five times more watch time on one video with a lot less views. So I'm, I'm attracting, and I'm getting to the right audience. Is what, what I'm trying to say. Mm. You like it just basic like this, more or less. Yeah, so let's go up there, we'll go up and have a look at these uh, results of this pH stuff. And then I'll show you the stuff that's been happening um, in the tanks, because I've been changing some things with the air. Let's do that, right? So I don't keep on repeating myself. 
All right, shrimp, let's, you know what it's like? It's like you're looking through a wee peephole I'm like this. Let me in, mother effers. Anyway, let's uh, look at these results. I'm gonna pan you down, just a wee tad. As we say in Scotland, a wee ball here. I'm gonna pan you in a wee ball here. Hopefully my camera doesn't fall over because you're in a funny spot here. Let's uh, have a look at these results. I'm gonna zoom you in a tad. A ball here, I want you guys to repeat after me. God, the zoom on this is so... Right. So we've been doing our tests. Let me see, can you even read? Oh, this cable is right in the way. Let me just unplug that for a second. Cable's in the way. This is a cable that I'm using to light my face when I'm filming when I'm sitting down. Get out. So we, we have our results here, right? So you can see from, from the beginning, we had like 100 litres of water. We had the date, the time, pH, conductivity, and then I was adding stuff. You guys already saw all of this stuff before, right? So we got to about here, right? It was where we saw that the for this, we added our Sarah pH down. I think it was five mil, it was five mil, you see it there? And we went down to 4.1 pH, which was quite low. Right, can you read it? And the conductivity was 329. Now, the, I tested it right after we dosed, so this might have been uh, not very accurate at the time. I probably should have let it rest before I tested these a little bit more. But you get the gist. So then we had several days, 17th of the 6th. Now, I don't think these days are 100% accurate because sometimes I don't know what day it is and I just write down what day I think it is. But today I'm pretty sure it's that day. <laughs> right, sometimes I just don't carry my phone with me all the time, you see. So we've been testing 17th of the 6th, 24, 12 o'clock, pH was 4.12, 3.27. Right, then we had the 19th, and it was pretty much the same, 4.14 uh, pH, a little bit of drop in conductivity, but pretty much the same. Right, so, and then the following days after, guys, I mean, this was over a good week, these test results, we're seeing that the pH was actually stable from almost the beginning, right, so it's 4.12 whole week passes, and for the last, what, three or four days, something like that, it's been 4.15, right, and the conductivity has also stabilized at 3.25, here, right, so what this means for us is the amount that I put in to this tank was too much, 4.15 is too low, but what it also shows us is that when we add acid to our reverse osmosis containers like this, that there isn't a rebound like there is in the tanks. And I think that might be caused with the active soil. Right, so with this, the acid reduces the pH, but in the tank, you will see that the initial pH drop to a low level. And then if your soil is still active, it will actually adjust it back up a little bit. And this is where we see the rebound. Right, we may actually do a test with like with that in another video of the same idea again, but we'll use a dummy tank. One that is, is uh, I won't go to these extremes again, guys. I go in this slow. I actually expected a rebound. That's why we put in five mil for 100 liters of water in the first place. But there was no rebound rate, so five mil is probably enough for 200 liters of water. But this is something we'll have to test. This water won't go to waste this in here. It's been in here for a little while. I don't like using, I don't like guys, let me just pan you up so we're not looking at this while we're talking. And zoom you in a wee bit. Right, I don't like using RO water that has been sitting for a, a, a decent length of time, like a week is okay, two weeks is probably okay. Beyond that, and you're probably gonna get stuff growing in the water that I don't want to add to my tanks. Um, so what we might do with this, we might still use this as a test bed here because we still have the water here. We have the readings from the initial setup. So let's put a line under this, like this. And I'm actually going to open the valve on this line here that will let, allow us to fill up this container right to the top right. So we're going to add in, you see over here, yeah, you can just see it. You hear the water there? We're going to fill this all the way up. The water is down there, you probably can't see it. We're going to let it fill up. We're going to let it fill up. And then our 100 litres will become 200 litres. And then we'll be able to adjust the 
the uh, conductivity with salts to the proper level because this is the level I want to get to you guys now is just over 300 for my neo carodina tank uh, for my carodina tanks I want to get my levels to over 300 from my carodina tanks because this was what I was recommended by a professional breeder to do to stop things like failed molts so we'll let this water fill up we'll adjust our uh, conductivity using our salts and once it's accurate we'll start to take her pH readings again and then we'll see if, if that 5 mil was enough for that volume of water does that make sense hopefully it does but it shows you guys that you should never really do this stuff inside your tank pH minus because you can see how how far the pH actually dropped I don't think it's a good idea for you to do this in the tank um, because I'm, I, I think that probably would kill your shrimp if it, if it dropped that much down to 4. I mean 4 is very acidic, it's like um, as acidic as orange juice maybe? Or is that more acidic? I'd have to google it but you get the gist there. Don't, don't add your pH down directly to the tank in the, these amounts of volume. That's why when we do it in, in these little ones with the other oak extract we use a dropper or a few drops. And it's also a good indicator guys that if you're able to add a few drops to your tank that um, if the pH does drop and it stays dropped that then it's a good indicator. Go and buy our, our results so far that your active soil is probably dead if it can't hold its pH and you're able to adjust it with some acid to make it drop again. It's probably not dead but it's probably lost its buffering capacity and as long as you keep on doing your little drops of acid into the water then yeah, you, your tank should be able to keep its low pH forever. God, I don't have rubble, don't I? Let's get back over here. All right, guys. So yesterday I was sent upstairs in my room, my little office room that I have up here, right? And you guys know that I have tanks up there that you've not seen yet. Um, and I was looking at them, I was thinking, you know, the flow in in these tanks was really, really poor. The airflow was really, really poor. So I thought, right, I need to go downstairs and I need to do something in my room that's going to allow me to actually pump more air into my tanks and by that I mean yeah, I, I wasn't using my tanks to the optimal ways or levels or efficiency or whatever you want to call it and I, was, I started to think about it more and more right and I, I was thinking along the lines of am I actually using my sponge filters properly the way that we had them before where they were slightly out of the water this might be a better idea if I can show you what we're talking about as we talk about here because yeah I, it might sound like I'm rambling on a bit but it will make sense if you see the results and what, what the tanks were like before so let's uh, pick some tanks and oh, by the way guys when I'm talking about adding more, more air what I did was also what I did was I actually added back in my old air pump up here, you see it, up to the top here. So the, the air for this, this one here, actually supplies air to all, all these tanks in this rack here, and some of the tanks on this side here, and it also supplies my tanks, plural, you notice I'm saying plural, to the ones upstairs. Now I have enough, enough room upstairs for more tanks, so I wanted more air to go up there as well, so that is that taken care of. But I was, when I was doing this, I was looking at my tanks, I was thinking, yeah, they're really inefficient in the way that they work, as in where. Let's have a look, because it's easier if we show you first. Alright guys, here we have our atypical sponge filter set up in, a, in an aquarium, right? And the way it works with sponge filters is the air will enter a little valve here, a little plastic valve. And it will go into this pipe here, and it will rise up here, right? And because of the dragging the water as the air bubble rises up this uplifter pipe here it will actually suck in water from our sponge filters here through the base and back up through the top like this and out of the little nozzle at the top now as you can see here I've actually adjusted my nozzles because I had them a different way right so my main goal guys with uh, sponge filters in the tank is filtration Right, so I was thinking about this yesterday, what is the best way to filter a tank? And it is to have enough flow that you're able to circulate with some flow and into every corner of the tank. Right, you can see here, see, that, see how the moss is moving a little bit? That's what you're after, right? It's no use 
actually having your outlet a way above the water like I used to have because I thought it was the better way. It's the way I used to see other people do it on, on YouTube. Um, because you're wasting a lot of energy. Now just let me lift you up for a second because I can't show you here. Let me show you. Like this. Right, if your nozzle is a way, way up out of the water, then in my opinion, I think you're wasting energy. Those bubbles that are the energy that's causing the drag in the water to be pulled through this uplift pipe, energy is being lost if you have the outlet above the water. Now because it's twofold, you're still be moving some water through the filter, but look at the, look at this flow on the top. This is energy that you're losing if you just have it actually above the water. Is it, can I show you here? Maybe it's easier if I show you here. Let's see if I can lift this one up. Alright, so you can probably just see the difference. Look how much flow there is from this sponge filter here compared to that one there. And it's the same air that's gone through as before. Can you see the difference? So I used to be under the impression that if the nozzle was above the water, the water would be more in this pipe, right? There'd be more air going through it and you'd get more, um, a higher oxygen level in the water in general, right? But I think what is a better issue, a better deal, a better way even to do it is to have your nozzle just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit under the water, right? So you want the very, very top part where the air comes out. Let me lift you up again. Like this. This top part here. I wonder if I could zoom in. The top part here. Right? All, all of these bubbles at the top that are not pushing that water there is lost energy, in my opinion. Right? Because it's quite easy to see the difference if you lower this. Right, if you lower it like this, the flow in the water is way, way, way more. Right, and it, the same, it seems to be a good point is just on the surface like this. And look at the flow, look. You see the difference? Maybe I can show you with this side one here as well. Let me pull it up. So lifting it, you can see the flow, you can see the speed of the water here. I pull this up. And you can see the flow has decreased. See the flow here? Watch what happens when I push it down. You see how that increased a lot? Right, and it seems to be the optimal place is for the nozzle to sit just in line with the water level here, you see it? So I was doing this yesterday in nearly all of my tanks. Let me zoom out a little bit. Or maybe zoom in because I'm going to show you this one here. This is a good example of, of this one being a little bit too low. So the water in here, the flow is slower. You see it? Because the nozzle is below the water surface. So to get this to work guys, ideally what you want to do is go over all your tanks, top up all your tanks like you see here, to the highest level that they will ever be. Right? And all of them. Right? You want your water level to be as high as possible. So for example, if you're doing your top-ups with reverse osmosis water, get them to the higher level and then do this. Right, so I topped this up after I adjusted these filters. Right, so this one is sitting just a tad too low. I'm going to zoom in so you can see the difference. Right, because we're losing flow here. There's not as much flow. The bubbles are coming at the filter and they're basically just going straight to the top. Right, let's lift this up. You see it? You see the difference? So you want this this level here to be in line with the water surface. So here's another example here. You see the difference, guys? This is inoptimal, 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 unoptimal, even optimal, unoptimal. This one's set up perfectly. See it? See the flow there? This one's unoptimal. Inoptimal, unoptimal prime. So you want to lift it up 
because you're losing all this flow here. What puts more oxygen in the water is this, the actual surface of the water being moved, right? So you, the more that you move the surface, the more oxygen is put back into the water. Now the only exception I have in my room where I don't do this is this type of filter here. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it through the tank. Maybe just, maybe just there. And it's this type of filter here. And this is one where it is a compartment filter or under gravel filter. And the reason this is above the surface guys is because if I get any power cuts, right, the shrimp will actually not be able to physically climb in here because it's above the water. You see it? You see? You can't climb in there because under gravel filters, let me show you up here, look. Under gravel filters like this. If the power goes off, if the inlet is below the water, the water line, the shrimp will climb in, right, and what will often happen is they'll get into the base and, and they'll, never, they'll never be able to get back out, right, so this is the only exception. Here's one here that is a slightly bit too high. Look at that. Looking good. This one's looking good. This one's a tiny bit too low, but the flow is really, really good. In line, loads and loads of flow. And this one here is just a little bit too low as well. So there you have it guys, that's what I've been doing with my filters. Yesterday and today I've been fixing all these sponge filters where the outlet is just above the water. Right? So this one is perfect. Perfect. Let's see over here. Perfect. You see what I'm trying to do here guys, I'm trying to optimise my filtration and at the same time increase the flow which in turn will actually help with our filtration again. Alright guys, let me show you from a different angle because yeah, I've noticed something else here. Just to try and get this to be as optimal as possible, let me show you. Because that's what you want from your filtration, isn't it? You want it to be as optimal as possible. Now you see on these ones here where you see there's like a slight bump in the water. But that means that these, these are still not optimal. Still not optimal. They look great, don't they? But what we're aiming for here, guys, is for that line to be as smooth. The one I'm actually pointing to right dead center here. Right, if there is a slight arch in the water surface like there is here and you can see on the back ones over here too that especially that one there then they're still not optimal right so it needs to go down or it needs to come up right so if there's an arch in the water i suspect that this one needs to come up a tiny bit right because the goal is to get as much surface movement as as possible while filtering the tank because if you, the more surface movement you get as we talked about before the more aeration you get the more flow in general and so let's see if we can actually capture this on camera. Let's zoom in. You guys are like, what do you mean capture on camera? It's just a sponge filter mark. Yeah, but you want to get your stuff as optimal as possible, right? So I think we have to go up the way or is it down the way? Let's see. Up the way, I think. Because I think this is caused by the air coming out and hitting water here and it's been forced up the way. Oh, actually worked. You see it? God, I'm actually optimizing this guy's to the millimeter, pushing it up and down. Now, I'm not sure it's actually visible for me to do it on some of my other tanks, just because of the angles and stuff. But yeah, you can probably do it this way as well. Look, what you're looking for is the arch, you can see like a double ripple there, you can see it. So this one needs to come up the way, doesn't it? Let's see, will that water line smooth it? Yeah, it did. You see how there's like a double, there's like a, a wall of water here, like a double wall of water. So that's slowing down flow in your tank. Let's uh, lift it up until this is completely flat. You see it? You want it flat to the point that the, this little, I don't know, you can see the little pressure line there. 
starts to disappear as the water flows across the top instead of hitting the water first and then you get maximum flow now I can see this on a lot of my tanks there you go isn't that amazing? isn't that amazing? so this one is the same lift it up There you go, and it's completely flat. Right, so the optimal level is for the very top of the outlet to be just a fraction of the water. So you want to avoid that little barrier or wave. These ones are good, this one's a little bit low. Lift it up. Look at that, that little pressure wave there is gone. So there is a compromise, I think, between flow the speed the, the, the air bubbles and the water flows it and getting it to move lots of water tiny little compromise because you, you don't want it too high like this where you start to lose flow coming out this way by a lack of pressure that's just perfect, you see it? let's do a few more by the way guys let me see, I thought I saw a buried girl in here today where is she? Boa. Buried female boa. I would like to show you on camera. Because it is my first buried girl that I've had from this shrimp. Very new. So it's cool to see some lovely buried shrimplets. Buried <laughs> mamas. Yeah, it looks much nicer. When that bump is it, when the bump has been removed. All right, so there is an optimal level. You see what I mean? It just goes to show that when we were doing this before, you see this is this is fine. These two. It just goes to show that when we were doing this before, in my other video, just because you see something on the internet doesn't mean that is the right way to do. I mean, there's probably. People saying that this isn't the best way either, but that one's fine, that one's fine. I don't know where this one is. This one's definitely not optimal. Look at it. It's just bubbles because they're coming out and hitting the water. They're just hitting the water and coming straight up. You see it? Instead of there being actual flow this way, let's lift this up. And then we start to get flow. You see it? Isn't that good? Now I think a lot of these ones are just a little bit, this one's fine, this one's too high. Remember guys, I have like 30 tanks in here so probably not going to bore you show me doing this on every tank but yeah you get the gist. So there is us optimizing our filtration. You know there she is there guys. Buried boar. You see, if she turns around, you probably will see she has a dark spot on her belly. It's very noticeable from the side that she's buried. So these are the ones I got from Raymond a while ago, and uh, yeah, she she definitely has bow genetics. See the big spots on her head. She has the little dot on the rocker, as Carrick calls it. And you can see the darkness in the belly. I don't know if this will stay in focus if I zoom in. Not bad actually, not bad. I wish you turned turn to the side so we can see you, but these shrimp are gorgeous. They are gorgeous, look at them. Isn't that amazing? Now I'm quite shocked because when I first got these, they were very, very pale. And I wasn't that impressed with them, but They've grown on me a lot. You see how dark that belly is? And she is definitely buried. You see it all this bit here? Awesome. <laughs> I was thinking I was thinking there guys that I'm probably the only person on YouTube that could make a super long video about how to optimize a sponge filter. <laughs> Because it's probably a very boring subject, but if you want to know all the juicy little details of how I'm breeding shrimp, this is what you're going to learn on my channel. 
Now, because I'm a great believer in learning by doing great, so in the past I've learned from um, other people, specifically, we're talking about sponge fillers here, right? So I've went and I've seen, oh, God, God, like these guys are breeding bazillions of shrimp. Look at their tank setups, right? And there's all, guys, there's always more to it than meets the eye, right? And I'll give you an example. Just say someone has a tank and they have 2,000 shrimp in it. Okay, so I'm a shrimp breeder, I'm looking at the tank and thinking, I'm thinking, I want to breed my shrimp like this. And, yeah, well, the truth is that they haven't actually bred the shrimp in the tank at all. They bought them and put them in this tank, and that's why their setup doesn't work for you. You get what I'm meaning? It's better to go buy people that actually have shrimp in the tank. They can actually show you it, that it actually works. It, uh, it actually works. So I was thinking, what else could we do this week? Right, so we have, I'm going to start to introduce a midweek feeding which I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm trying to think how to space this out, the feedings, because I don't, guys, I don't want to do overfeeding for videos. So we're going to go from one feeding a week, because I can see it is probably just not enough, right? I, I want to maybe do two feedings a week and, you know, watch my feeding like a hawk kind of thing. Because one feeding is when I, I notice that the baby shrimp survival is okay, it's not fantastic, but it's not okay. When I was using powdered foods before, my shrimp like baby survival was much higher. But then I was getting a lot of deaths in the tank, adult deaths. So there is like a, a balance, an equilibrium, right, that we have to meet in the tank. There has to be a compromise between uh, feeding your tank, feeding the babies and the amounts that you put in. So we're going to try a second feeding in a week. So we'll, we'll do that tomorrow. Um, I think we're going to use powdered foods Maybe. I haven't decided yet. I've been warned off using powdered foods in tanks because it pollutes the tank, but yeah, a lot of the foods that I've used before that have been great have been foods that have been solid and then they've kind of went to powder and they've spread all over the place and you know, there is there is like a way that you will find that works for you. So that's what we have in store for tomorrow, right? Which will be, guys, one second for you. I can't even click anymore. One second for you. There you go. So it is Tuesday for me, right? So that means today is a uh, little light feeding into all the tanks. And uh, yeah, but by the way, we shouldn't forget our morning coffee. Mm. Mm. Uh, so I'm going to try this, guys. We're going to feed some tetramine tabs, this stuff here. And I'm, I'm going to actually break this into quarters because one tablet is huge for the size of tanks that I have. So I'm going to break these into quarters. And we'll put it into the tanks. I've already checked this morning, made sure all the feeding dishes and stuff are near the front. And it's quite important with a food like this that you put a feeding dish in because this is the type that breaks up quite a bit. I do have other excellent shrimp foods as well, but some of them are very, very solid. And I want something that can spread around the tank just a little bit because, yeah, I have, guys, I have bazillions of babies in these tanks now. Right, and they're all hungry, they need food. So let's uh, start with this, right? I'm gonna pan you down because we have to, have to actually break these up. I'll pan you down, down there, look. All right, shrimplets, these are the tabs. Let's have a little look at them here. And normally I just break these up with my hands because they're so soft. I'm not sure if this will focus on this just because of the angle, but yeah, I think it is. I break these up into little quarters, right? So you wanna break them in half. Like this. You see what I mean when I said they're really, really soft? And break them in half again. Right, and yeah, one side is bigger than another, but some tanks have more shrimp, so. Let's do it again. You see the process. And uh, food like um, Glass Garden, shrimp dinner as an example. You just can't do this. The food is absolutely solid. And sometimes a whole piece of food is just too much for a tank. Let's do a few more. For the very big tanks I have in this room, a whole tablet is fine. I think the, I think the camera has actually flipped upside down. But I'll have to correct that. You see, so let's uh, do a couple more. 
and this will probably be enough for today like so you see now good now we'll get these into the tank all right guys so let's uh Let's put this all in here. Now you see the food here? Let's uh, put it in. And because this food is quite light, it actually breaks apart quite easy. So I'm actually going to use our feeding apparatus, aka PVC pipe, right? And all I'm going to do is get a piece of food, put it in like this, put it above the actual dish, and just wait until it drops into the feeding dish like so and then move on to the next one so we'll do a couple on camera here just so you guys can see what I'm actually doing oh I think that was quite a small bit for that tank so we'll put two pieces in because there's literally hundreds of shrimp in this tank it won't be enough if I just put one piece in and, and tanks where there's hardly any shrimp guys are putting smaller pieces just use your brain for this kind of stuff Yeah, because the last thing you want to do now is, now that you have your tanks in such good condition after you've been watching my channel for a while and you're finally getting buried shrimp and you see babies, the last thing that you want to do is overfeed the tank and just undo all the good work that you've done. Alright, so I'll keep on doing this and I'll come back in a few seconds or maybe five five minutes, something like that, right? We'll give give the tanks a little bit of time. We'll come back and we'll see what has actually happened. Did we make the right choice to put food in the tank? Let's see what happens. All right, guys, I thought I'd put you on the tripod so you can see a little bit easier here. The food is almost gone completely here. And this is just the first tank. Loads of babies. I think it was a good choice for us to start feeding again like this. Um, it's literally only been five minutes since we put the food in the tank and it's all gone already. Yeah, I think it's the same with this tank as well. I think they've, they've actually grabbed the food and they've spread it all over the place. You can see shrimp away up there with the food as well. So it wasn't too much and it wasn't too little. Yeah, so this tank is a bit slower but you can see the same effect there's no food in the dish at all now so they've grabbed it and it's spread all over the place and guys this is a good example here of why you're better using a feeding dish see here they've obviously had the food here at some point and it's went into the substrate all right so i was actually surprised at how many red types of boa phenotypes that there are in this tank because uh, I can't remember putting this man in here but they all came for it made a slight overfeeding if you have a turkey baster guys you can actually remove all this as well so yeah alright so maybe this was slight overfeeding here but there is a lot of shrimp in this tank but you can see there is a decent amount of food still in here so yeah we'll, we'll see if we come back in half an hour and it's still there then we'll remove it too same with this tank Looks like the majority of the shrimp come to the front to get some food, so this is a success. Same here, looks like the majority of them came to the front. Some beautiful shrimp here, fish bones, boas, and there's some babies in there too. Golden's doing awesome. They went hammer. Guys, what I'm really pleased with is just the amount of shrimp that have come to the front and all the tanks for the food, so yeah. Uh, Second feeling is definitely is on the cards from now on. Aren't these guys gorgeous? I can't wait to see some of the babies. Okay, so the food was here and it's been a bit of a free-for-all. I kind of came back late for this and yeah, I think they've grabbed it and they've taken it all behind. You can see some shrimp activity in the back, but these guys definitely needed a second feeding. So in this tank, I actually can't see any food at all anywhere here not even a small bit so yeah th these guys definitely needed another feeding okay same with the cold tank 
they've literally destroyed the bit of food that we put in here. I can't even, I can, well, I can see kind of some little bits right in the dead center, but they've taken it and they've uh, spread it all over the tank. Okay, so I said I was going to show you the good with the bad. And uh, this is a tank where I probably shouldn't have fed. Now I have noticed these shrimp are a tiny bit lethargic, as in they, they in general don't all come bustling to the front for food. Right, and the survival rate of the young isn't too great either, so this is something that we'll have to um, inspect. We'll have to get our pH meters out and stuff and see what's uh, actually happening with this tank. It could be, guys, I think it could be that the pH is just a tad on the low side, it's like 4.5 or something which might be a little bit too low. Okay, same story with this tank as well. There's actually quite a decent amount of shrimp in this tank. There's like 20 adults and a handful of babies and yeah, they have actually taken the food behind this leaf over here somewhere. I can see there's some kind of activity. So I'm taking it that as what's happened. Okay, the Opa'ula tank uh, looks like they were pretty hungry as well. I don't know if I can zoom in here or not. I can't, I can't actually tell guys if I'm in focus even with my glasses on here so you have to bear with me for a second. Am I getting too close? I am there. Maybe about there. Somewhere, yeah, they, that looks pretty in focus but yeah, you can see that these guys are very very active. They always eat all of the food. I actually can't see any of the food again. Okay, how do the cherries like this extra feeding? It looks like there's a decent amount in here. Look at that lovely bristle nose pleco. <laughs> Alright guys, let's have a little look with this macro lens. I know it's not perfect, but these are the cherries. It looks like they've had a good feed. The food's spread all over the place, but that's to be quite expected with the bristle nose pleco in the tank. Looking good. Alright guys, I think I feel a little road trip coming on because uh, I want to get something for these lights up here. I've had an idea in my head. And I think we're going to go and get the stuff to do a race. So the idea is basically this. I want to lift my lights off the tanks because yeah, I don't see too much of a difference if I lift my lights off the tanks this much. Like up to up here, I can see my shrimp perfectly fine. Right, and it means that the top of the tanks, the, the entire tank depth gets more light than it currently is because now the light is just hitting a certain section of the tank. Let me pick you up, it's always easier for me to explain if I pick you up. Okay, bear with me here guys, right? Bear with me. You can see how much light is hitting this part of the tank and how much light is not hitting that part of the tank, right? And remember Plants are our nutrient exporters, right? So these are the things that will help us keep our tanks clean. Right, and I don't really see any difference if I do this, look. If I grab this light here, and I lift it up at least halfway to about here, I can see my shrimp still perfectly fine. And it means that the rest of the tank gets more light. You see it? Watch this, look. See what I mean? See how it goes dark behind? More light dark, more light, dark, you get the gist. And so, let's sit down a second and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Well, you guys all know the rate that I used to identify, wait for it, wait for it, listen, before you click off, I used to identify as a fisherman, right? I no longer do fishing anymore, but I still I used to identify as a fisherman. So I still know all the th pieces of equipment that were used when fishing for certain species, right? on for a certain type of animal called a pike, we used to use a wire trace, right? And you get these wire traces in all different lengths, right? And it's basically a piece of wire. It could be, I don't know, it could be like 20 kilos strong, 30 kilos strong, something like that, right? And on the end, there'll be a little swivel. And on the other end, there'll be like a little clip, right? And my idea was this guy, it's going to be really simple. We have cable ties here, right? I'm simply going to put our little clip under our shelf here because you probably just see it there, but there's little bars that go across. We're going to put our wire over the bars, through the cable tie, and clip them together, right? And then we're gonna have wire suspension for our lights, right? So that is the plan. I need to ask the wife to drive me to the place to buy them. One momento.
All right, guys, welcome back. Another day, another coffee, as we say here on Mark Trim Tanks. And yeah, guys, I actually filmed this next part and it didn't come out. I didn't save it properly, so we're going to do it again. Um, I actually filmed myself going to the shop and getting this stuff and whatever else. And yeah, it, I don't know what it was. It was like a corrupt uh, disc or corrupt memory card rate. But I've been to the shop, guys. I've been to the shop and I went away and I bought quite a few of these. Some of you that are fishermen will recognize what these are and these are just wire traces used for pike fishing. So I bought a few different types and the ones that seemed to work well on this side were the longer ones so these are 15 to 30 centimeter wire traces. And guys yeah I could have used like bits of rope or whatever else but I wanted to and make sure that there was no chance of these lights falling in the water right so these wire traces in general are well into the kilos for how strong they are so let's get one opened and I'll show you these a little bit closer because these are what they are oh yeah so th there's I think there's five different sets of wire traces in here five possibly and we're going to use the longest ones because yeah, these short ones are kind of short. I'm not going to throw these away either because we'll be able to use them on other tanks, on other builds, so it makes sense. Let me see, is the price on these? No. It was something like 50 kroners a packet, which is about four pound or something. Four or five dollars, something like that, right? So let's get our wire traces undone like this. Right, we have long ones here. Remember I said to you I did one like there. We have another one the same length. I have other pockets. So we have enough wire traces in here for us to do probably all the lights in the shrimp room. You can see the length here as well. So these are a tiny bit too long, these ones. And there are shorter ones. But these ones are good because you can double them up like I've done here. You probably can't really see it without that well. And that's why I'm going to show you me doing another one right here. We're going to do this one here. You see it, you see it there, this one. And we're going to put it to the same height there. So for that guys we'll need uh, two cable ties because the cable ties are good to add on because the cable ties are adjustable right and okay, you add a cable tie and it's just much much easier to actually do your stuff right so we need to put our cable ties on first if you guys can even see a couple of clicks like this let me turn you around and we might zoom in a little bit so you can see just the ball here better. Let me see. Little shrimp fab. Right, so we're going to put another cable tie on here. And so this this is actually fixed a problem with having the lights in the tank, but in doing so it's created another problem which we'll talk about in a minute. Right, so next we're going to take our wire trace like this and underneath here you can see on this rack by the way which I noticed when I was at the shop that, that when it didn't record properly that they actually have new ones like this that are in like a, a brown and black colour and they're metal shells so those would have been better than these monstrosities get your wire trace and I'm going to look along under here where I have my other ones you guys can't see but guys you know what we might better be doing here is, is reducing your height just a tad there, so you can see the you know the wire rocking underneath. Let's do this one first because it'll be easier if I could do this side, right? And I'm going to look where these are roughly in line, and the orientation left and right we can adjust after simply by moving the cable ties. And I'm going to go on this. Is it two in to here? Right? So it's about here that we need to add our cable tie, our wire trace mark. You know, sometimes guys I'm like the world's worst for actual the spoken language I'm not good English even though it's my main language it's probably why I struggle so much with uh, learning Norwegian so you can see the wire trace hanging down here can you see it let me zoom you in Right, and see that this cable tie here? We're going to actually just hook it around this, right? And because these wire traces they have little swivel on the end, 
Right, and a little loop on the other end, you're actually able to join them together. It might be a little bit difficult, but nonetheless, you're going to be able to join them together. Right, so we have to lift our light up like this. And it doesn't matter if the light goes in the water a wee bit because these are waterproof or water the equivalent of waterproof I'm going to try and not make it go in the water but you can see here we have our little clip we're going to clip it into our loop like this and that is the first one done you see it let's do the second one same thing again new wire trace Hopefully guys you can actually see something of this because yeah, I'm not the very best at filming. We're going to go two in again, up here, directly above where the wire trace is. Let's see, where is it? It's on this one. Yeah, we, we chose the right one. We're going to actually open this first this time because I didn't do it first the last time. There's a little clip on it, you can see. Maybe if it ever focuses. I'm just doubly making sure guys when I'm doing this because it, it's something that is a wee bit hard to fix after. Alright, so let's get this through. You see our second wire is down like this. We lift up our light. And you see how this is working already. You can see how it's working already. Right, so what this will do guys is it will mean that more of our actual plants in the tank let me zoom you back out again it will mean that more of our actual plants in the tank will will actually get more light right so as we talked about before plants are the best nutrient exporter them and filtration so it makes sense for you to do it like this right and these these are actually really level already you look at look at the light all the way along past my big head they seem pretty level already right but the the drawback with doing this and I mentioned it a little bit before was these lights are held together with cable ties these ones so um, as soon as I start lifting on this point the arch wants to fold in it on in itself if that makes sense so there's another little fix that we have to do here to make the lights play out again like this you see what I mean? You may be able to see more of it like this way. So there is another little fix that we have to do. And I'm going to keep the tabs on these just now in case I want to adjust them a little bit more. Because as I said, right, I did actually use a spirit level on the top of these. And I said they were way, way, way um, out of um, flatness, levelness. Right, but with my eye they're perfectly straight and it's probably because the floor in here isn't straight because there's a floor drain and all the water wants to go towards the floor drain right? so there's no real levels in the shrimp room it's very noticeable like nearer the wall it's much higher than the centre but that's the way it should be right, so the fix guys I was thinking about for these is there's a little lip here and there's a little lip on this side here what if we drill a hole through one side. Can you even see what point it? Let me zoom in again. Right, so on here you can see there's two little, you can see the issue, like it wants to fold together and then the light opens up in the, the top. We don't want that, we want it to be fully open or fully closed like this. Right, so the thing I was thinking about doing is drilling a hole through this little bit here and this little bit here, again, using a couple of smaller cable ties and just pinching these parts together. And it will open up the lights again. Like this, you see what I mean? So that way is bad, this way is good. And that is what we have to fix. So I'm going to find my drill bit. And we'll get those fixed on these lights. God, I'm in half close. Alright guys, hopefully this works. Hopefully. Right, so we have a drill here and yeah, I'm just going to try and drill through the underside in this one first. Oh, it wants to wander.
Wow, this plastic is tough. Maybe I need to do it on this side. Yeah, I didn't think the plastic would be that tough. There we go. So all I need now is like some small cable ties. Let me grab the top bit. And we'll try and do the same. But you can see what I mean with the issue with these where they fold in on each other. Alright. Let's try a little bit of cable tie in here, it doesn't have to be big I have loads of different colours so you maybe use a white one so it matches the lovely plastic hopefully this will go through, but you see all these bits of plastic this is the stuff that we don't want to go into the tank and I probably will only need to do these end parts I think like this, you see what I mean? Do you guys love it when a plan comes together? There you go, that's your new names in the comment section for the people that come early, you can be called the A-Team. So you see what I mean how this closes this gap quite a bit just by these edges being pinched. Like that, you see it? Now I probably can't get this any, yeah I can't, I can't even move it now. So this is a very good way, very very good simple fix for this. Let's see, do I have my wee sharp knife handy? Am I even recording? Hopefully. Right, so the sharp knife is really good for this. You see, yeah that sounds awesome. Doing stuff above tanks is never easy. But there you go, that's the first one done. Hmm? And then we just have to turn it around. And the job's a good one. This light is done. Yeah, I'm happy with that. That's really, it's really opened up that light. If anything, we might actually do the other ends as well. Because it just looks a mess. You see what I mean? Over here. Alright guys, you can see the issue here where it's just slightly out of alignment. You see it? It's actually very, very tight, you know that this is very hard to move. Maybe it wasn't in alignment to begin with. I just wonder if we actually need to fix this. Hmm. Guys, tell me in the comment section below, would you fix this or would you leave it? Let's see. Um, we'll see how hard it is to drill because the pilot holes are never the easiest thing in the world to drill here. Yeah, we should maybe give it a go and just see if it can be done. Because uh, it might save us some work in the future. So it was kind of hard to go through that way, wasn't it? Maybe go through this way first. And then go on the inside. I don't know if I can get it from this angle. Can I turn it? Yeah, I can. Alright, so the wee lesson learned there is it might be easier to drill all the holes first and then put the cable tie in here, it would be easier to move. Yeah, but I'm happy with this fix. I'm happy with this fix. Alright, so the total cost of this build, let's roughly go over it right now, would be when I bought these lights they were 70 kroners each. 75 kroners each, which is about $6, something like that. So there's two of them, that's $12. Right, the cable in here, you had to buy separate. Each cable was $2. So that's 12, 14, 16. Is that right? 6, 6, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Yeah, the plug was already on it. The price is some cable ties. Uh, what did we say about the wire traces? Was it 50 kroners, which is about $4? So in all, all in all, it's about $20 for these lights. Um, they are fully waterproof. I think 
I wouldn't like to dunk these in the water or anything like that but yeah these are more than good enough and guys th this is the little things I look for when I do stuff like this is you see the back wall there watch the wall look you see it and what that is telling me there is there's light spill and so this is something that you're always going to get if you want to lift the lights up a little bit but if you're not bothered about having um, access and plants growing and stuff like that that's something that you should look for you should lower your light until that light spill is gone all right let's uh, trim this off I don't know where that went but let it go in the tank let's clean the plastic off and there we have it let's have a look from the front all right guys, so this is what it finally looks like. The finished one is on the left and on the right is the one that we've still do. And you can see the difference, see how it's opened up in the top dead center of the screen all the way along. They are pretty level, so I'm happy about that. I'm not gonna bother changing anything else, but yeah, the, the light is more than good enough for my tank. So let's zoom in on the tank. Oh, let's zoom in on the tank and you'll be able to see what I mean. Is that bright enough? This is what I see as well. So lifting, lifting the lights up just that little bit like this will, uh, as we talked about before, it will help with our um, nutrient exporting the plants, salita, and then triple the plants, blah, 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 whatever else. So it, it's a really good thing to do is to try and get your lights to work in, in their optimal condition. All right, guys, I actually went ahead and did the bottom two tanks as well, but I just want to show you like a close up and stuff of how much better this is right so lights are lights as you all know but look at the difference it makes to the top of the tanks when you're actually able to see in to stuff all these all this uh, moss and stuff at the back will probably start to grow much much better look at this thing there's moss actually coming out of the tank at the top that i never even knew was there before but um yeah this is definitely a better way to do it. i'm actually able to see in a little bit and see what's going on in the tank and yeah it's actually allowing me to see all the babies and stuff in the java moss that I just didn't know was there before and we did the bottom part here now when you have a janky setup like like I do where nothing is actually bought to this meant to be together you're going to get situations like this where lights just don't fit together but it's okay I wanted to try and keep the same uh, light distance profile is the one above up here with this tank just so I can see in the top all these plants at the back and stuff are starting to get more light than they were before so as we talked about before as well we should start to see um, I would imagine our filtration will start to work better because plants are a big part of that this one again as I mentioned was a little bit janky because I have the light quite far forward in this because I have a, a hang on back filter in the back but this is plenty enough light for this tank you see what I mean guys lifting them up has not really made a huge difference and it's actually spread the light out all over the tanks alright guys there was one other thing that I did want to conclude remember this little experiment that we were doing with our water well here are the results here I'm not going to put it into the tank we're just by the side let's briefly talk about this yeah so this basically stabilized um, a week after we added the acid but as you guys remember the acid the pH was too low right so as you can tell here I filled this barrel up so we more or less doubled our water right and our pH was still too low I haven't actually written it down here, I actually wrote it down after I fixed it. So, so now it's 5.6, 5.62, but it was still too low, it was 5.1 or something like that, right? And how I managed to raise, raise the pH up a little bit was I added half a scoop of uh, GHKH+, right? So that little bit KH, carbonate hardness, went into, the, into there and I was actually able to see the pH come up maybe within 10 minutes after I put it in right, and this is a much much better level than it was it was actually higher than this when I checked it before 
it was like 5.62. So this we might actually be seeing a rebound here as the acid that was in there is eating away at the carbon harness because when I came in this morning it was 5.62, now it's 5.48. All right, so I think the thing that we can take away from this is yeah, try and not make mistakes when you're adding too much acid and whatever else to your RO water. And I was doing this as an experiment so you guys could see how this stuff works, but um, yeah, don't ever put your acids and whatever else directly into your tank because this is the reason why you get swings like this. So, but in the future, going forward, right, we'll have uh, 200 litres of water in this. I'm quite confident that 5 mil is enough because we actually added guys 5, 6, 7 mil to start with, right, and our results as we showed before, we're still a little bit too low. Right, so 5 mil is probably perfect for me for this amount of water with our buffer, okay? Right guys, I actually pressed the button on my camera so I don't know if I'm in focus or not, I can't tell. <laughs> right, um, that's our video for this week, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, have an awesome weekend, if you want to uh, watch more of my videos then please go over here and YouTube will pick the next best one for you and guys have an awesome, awesome weekend. Thanks for watching.